After all, if a girl wears a dazzling necklace worth a fortune, should it make a man want to kiss her or kill her? The National Broadcasting Company presents The Adventures of the Abbots, starring Claudia Morgan and Les Damon as Pat and Gene Abbott, those popular characters of detective fiction created by Francis Crane. NBC invites you to join Pat and Gene each week at this time for an exciting adventure in romance and crime. In our story tonight will be Miss Sherry Britton making her dramatic debut in radio. Now here is Claudia Morgan as Gene Abbott to set the stage for tonight's puzzle in murder. A story entitled, The Fabulous Emerald Necklace. The necklace was a breathtaking collection of precious stones. It belonged to Mrs. Dexter Blake, a curious young woman without any social background who'd somehow managed to marry the heir to the Blake fortune. Late one night, she and her husband had left the Stardust Club and were strolling to their Park Avenue townhouse, which was just around the corner from the club. Really, Kathy, I don't think you behave very well at the club. Oh, will you stop picking on me, Dexter? Don't be so prissy. You've been doing it all evening. I just had a little fun at the club. After all, how square can you get? Really, sometimes I... Now, look, I, I've had more than enough trouble because of you. The snobbery deal again? Now, it, it isn't snobbery, Kathy. It's just that I do have a rather well-known family. We're sensitive to publicity. The colonists were very cruel when you married me, and every time you misbehave publicly, you're just proving their point. You believe their point, too, don't you? I mean that there's something very wrong about your having married a divorcee, especially one whose family wasn't descended from the original settlers, pilgrims, or whatever it was. Oh, let's drop it. It's come up too often. Now, let's settle it. You'd like to get out of our marriage, wouldn't you? Well, I... No, darling, I, I've never said that, never thought well, Don't it. try thinking of it, Dexter. You'd never make it. If you don't like bad publicity, just imagine what I'd do if you ever threatened to get rid of me. I'd give Shut those... Up, Mrs. Blake, come back into that doorway. What? Uh, who are you? What's the idea? Get away from her. I said for you two to get off the straight end of that doorway. I've got a 38 here and I'll empty it into both of you. Why, well, Walter? Go on. Into the doorway. That's it. Oh, I'll take that necklace of yours, Mrs. Blake. Cheap hoodlum. You think you can get away with this just because you're waving that gun? Why, I... That's it, Mrs. Blake. I'll take the necklace. Thank you. You give me that necklace? Take your hands off me. No, police! Police! I told you not to do that. I told you. Uh oh, he... Come back here, you. Oh, Dexter. Dexter, he's dead. He's dead. The jewel thief disappeared into the night, leaving Mrs. Dexter Blake hysterical beside the dead body of her husband. Pat and I had been home that night. All we knew about Kathy Blake was what we'd read in the gossip columns. But the next morning, Pat had been invited to the Sterling Insurance Company. He was in the office of a company executive, Frank Tracy. I uh, sent for you, Mr. Abbott, because this case calls for a man of your caliber. We'd be glad to pay any reasonable fee, of course. Is this a reasonable case, Mr. Tracy? Well, frankly, it's rather difficult. That's why I'd rather you handle this case than any one of our routine investigators. Uh, our company uh, insured Mrs. Blake's necklace, uh, Mr. Abbott. Mm -hmm. For how much? $200,000. Can Mrs. Blake describe the man who attacked him? Well, she's uh, quite vague about it, but uh, something very fascinating came to me in the mail this morning. Oh, what is it? A note from the killer. May I see it? Mm hmm. You'll uh, notice, of course, that it's been written very much like a ransom note in a kidnapping. No use of pens, pencils, or typewriter. The letters uh, look as though they've been cut out of uh, newspapers and pasted together. Yes, they do. He uh, makes what he believes is a business offer. 
As you see, he wants $50,000. For that sum, he'll leave the necklace where our company can find it. We return it to Mrs. Blake and uh, save $150,000. Yes, it's very wise, too. The thief knows he'd have a difficult time disposing of the pieces through a fence. It's identified too easily. Exactly. I see he doesn't mention how he proposes to have you give him the cash. I suppose he'll get in touch with you later. Exactly. Now, couldn't we trap him by promising to pay off at a certain place and uh, at a certain time? I doubt it. Nobody would try a swindle like this without planning it very carefully. Well, then what do we do? I'd like to talk to the dead man's wife. All right. I'll arrange for you to meet uh, Mrs. Blake. Oh, uh, and you'd better have your guard up. She's very beautiful. And very clever. I think of her as a kind of uh, Lucrezia Borgia. Oh, really? Yes, especially for one reason. And what's that? Lucrezia murdered her husband. I was gallivanting around San Francisco buying play suits for the summer. A very innocent cherub indeed. And that husband of mine was closeted in a private office with Mrs. Dexter Blake. Mrs. Blake, you say you hardly saw this man who shot your husband? Well, it was very dark, Mr. Abbott. He pushed us away from the lamppost into the doorway. I could just see his shadow. How tall was the shadow? Mm, average height. It's, well, it's very difficult for me to be accurate. I was terribly excited. I didn't notice details. Well, if you couldn't see very well, you could uh, hear. How about his voice? Mm, rather odd, come to think of it. He didn't sound like the usual gangster. Seemed rather cultured. Mm -hmm. That all the information you can give me? Mm, I'm afraid so. Sorry I'm not being very helpful. Well, unfortunately, Mrs. Blake, these cases often lead to our having to ask embarrassing questions. Probing into the darker corners of people's lives. Go right ahead. Are you getting along well with your husband? Oh, I suppose so. How well do people get along after they've been married quite a while? I'm not a philosopher, Mrs. Blake, just a detective. Did you have reason to believe your husband was, um, well, mixed up in any activity he'd rather you didn't know about? Is that your diplomatic way of saying, was there another woman? I don't think so. I don't follow you, Mr. Abbott. I wear a necklace... A very expensive one. Some thief holds us up, becomes excited, shoots my husband. And you're making a, a whole French novel out of it. That's yes, because Mrs. Blake very often what looks like a simple hold-up or assault or what have you is actually more complicated than it appears. It's often a cover-up for something more deeply motivated. I am not a woman of very deep motivations. My interests and desires are normal and obvious. As for my late husband... Yes? Dexter was not a man of many dimensions either. Just folks, huh? With a few million dollars. You're a detective, Mr. Abbott. Not a humorist. Who collects on your husband's life insurance? I do. All of it? All of it. How much is that? Oh, about half a million. Do you also inherit all his property? Mm-hmm. It's worth another million and a half. Well, we were speaking of motives a while ago. You'll need an awfully good attorney to get you out of this. Why? I'm perfectly innocent. But I have an intuitive feeling about you, Mrs. Blake. Nothing too definite to support it. I think you didn't care very much for Dexter, but you uh, had quite a passion for his checkbook. What of it? Well, for instance, you find yourself a mug. You make a deal with him... He holds you up, gets your $200,000 necklace as payment, and takes a pot shot at Dexter. You're the helpless wife. Dexter's a very dead pigeon. You come into Dexter's money, the mug disappears with his two hundred grand. Very nice. I could have had anything I wanted from Dexter. Do you think I'd trade in a comfortable spot like that for the electric chair? Maybe. Lots of people try it. You're wasting your time, Mr. Abbott. Oh, really? Oh, not that I mind. Being questioned by a very handsome detective is so pleasant. You've changed the subject. Certainly. You're much more interesting. 
married Mr. Abbott? Mm-hmm. Oh, good. That makes it more fun. Oh, haven't you had enough entertainment these past few days? Mm, not of the right kind. You wrote my phone number in your notebook. Will you call me? What for? Why, you amaze me, Mr. Abbott. Some men have to be told everything. That night at home, Pat told me about the case. Only because he had to, as I found out soon enough. Now, dear, you know my policy about keeping you out of my cases. Yes, teacher. Now, for once in your life, you're going to come in very handy. Oh, well, now you're getting sensible. You have such a brilliant wife, I never could see why you didn't use her talent. Yes, well, look, brilliant wife. There's a way to get at this guy who likes emeralds and target practice with millionaires. Well, how do you do it? With a decoy duck. <laughs> that me? Mm-hmm. Well, what do I do? We buy you a necklace. Oh, this gets better all the time. We buy you a cheap necklace. Are you and Jack Benny, huh? We get our friend Nick Scudder to put a line in this column about the gal who's always at the Stardust Club wearing a sensational necklace. That ought to start our boyfriend, who likes sparklers, chasing around after you. Now, he'd try to pick you up at the club. But I'm hard to get, huh? No, easy, very easy. Uh, this wouldn't be tight casting, would it? <laughs> now, to get the jewels you'll be wearing, he'll have to get you alone. So he'll probably ask you to his place. You'll both go outside and get a cab. Pat Abbott, do you mean to say you're actually suggesting that I go to a nightclub, make a pitch at a killer, and then take a taxi ride alone with him? Well, it'll be a special kind of cab. What's special about it? I'll be driving it. Mm -hmm. Sounds like quite a Halloween party. Well, it might not turn out to be so jolly, dear. That's what I don't like about my little scheme. You see, somebody in this deal might, uh... Might, uh, What? I decide that your throat is a good place to put old razor blades. We bought a flashy-looking necklace. Nick Scudder plugged away in his column about, quote, the mysterious gal seen every night at the Stardust Club with a rock-studded horse collar that could pay the national debt, unquote. Outside the club a few nights later, Pat was at the wheel of a taxi. I was inside the club sitting alone at the bar. A very oily-looking Joe came over to me, smiled, and... Well, I knew this was our man. I fluttered my eyelids in the best Hollywood manner, and we were off to the races. Don't tell me you're one of those awful people who like to drink alone. No, no, no. I'm just new in town, and I haven't made friends yet. Well, you've made one now. My name's Al. Al Francis. Oh, mine's Jean. Why, do I join you for a drink? Not at all. Do you always play the big bad wolf with all the red riding hoods who come here? Just the beautiful ones. <laughs> they fascinate me for more reasons than one. Oh, what do you mean? I'm, uh, psychic about them. I'll take you, for instance. I'll make a guess. I'd say you were married to a very wealthy man. Much older than you are. You're sick of him. You're bored. You've come here for some excitement. Uh, go on. That much was a guess. Now I'll tell you something I'm very sure of. You're looking for excitement, lovely. You're shopping at the right counter. I wasn't quite sure if Al Francis was just being amorous or... If he suspected I was a plant and might suddenly give me the same treatment he'd given Dexter Blake. We stayed at the Stardust Club for about an hour. Francis hardly even eyed my necklace. He became more romantic and suggested we go to his apartment. We stepped outside to hail a cab. A cab I knew would be driven by Pat. Hey, taxi. Oh, here comes one, Al. Oh, great. Go ahead, Jean. Step in. Where to, Doc? 1785 Bayside. Right. Nice to be alone for a while, huh, Jean? Just the two of us? Mm-hmm. Jean, every minute I was in the club, I... I wanted to kiss you. Oh, Al, the driver can see it. Why does he care? Come here. 
Oh, Did you say 1785 Bayside? Yes, yes, I did. Okay. Look at those stars up there, Jane. See? Through the window. We mustn't let them go to waste. Just one kiss. Come close to me. Closer. Oh. Hey, Jane. Doc! I don't think there is any 1785 Bayside. I have reason to think there is, driver. You see... I've been living there for nine years. Oh, okay. Gene, honey, I never thought I'd be lucky enough to meet anyone like you. I always used to say to myself, deep in my heart, Al, I said... Hey, you think the Yankees got a chance this year? Look, friend, just drive the car. Okay, Doc. When you walked into the Stardust Club, Gene, I thought for a while that someone might be with you. Then I realized you were alone. Took a lot of courage to go over to you. I don't know what I'd done if you turned me down. We're together now. That'll be 45 cents. Thanks. Come on, Jean. Al, I... I, I've sort of a headache. I've got just a thing for it. Come on. No, really, I, I think I'd, I'd better keep the cab and go home. I'm so tired. You'll feel better when we get upstairs. I have some turkey on ice and a bottle of rice. Yes, later. but the thanks, but... Ah, don't I... disappoint me. Just for a few minutes, we Come can... Come on, bud. You heard the lady. She wants to go home. Who asked you to get into this? I invited myself. You know, I met some fresh cab drivers in my day, but you... Look, the you... lady has a headache. But she's going home now. Well, you're going to get real cute about this, aren't you? Good night, pal. Oh, I'd love to knock your teeth down your oh, throat. Oh, Al, don't start a fight with him, please. Oh, come on, bud. Let's play rough. I don't like your face. I think I could fix it up a little. Well, Al, please. Cr- no one must know you and I are... All right, Gene, all right. I'll call you tomorrow. What's your number? Uh, just meet me at the club. Same time as tonight. Fine. Bye, Gene. Bye. You're the most wonderful cab driver I've ever had, Pat. Oh, thank you, ma'am. Where to now? Just drive along the bay. But we don't live out this way. Yes, I know. But didn't you hear what the man said? We mustn't let those stars go to waste. Well, the fellow I borrowed the cab from is waiting. It's all right. Cab drivers understand things like that. Pat was just leaving his office. He was on his way to see Frank Tracy. Come in. Good morning, Mr. Abbott. Well, Mrs. Blake. Do you have a moment? I certainly am. I've been wondering about what sort of progress you've been making. Have you found any clues to the identity of the man who killed my husband? Oh, I don't talk about my cases until they're cleared up. Oh, I think I have a right to know what you're doing. After all, I was married to Dexter. Frightened, Mrs. Blake? Why should I be? Afraid that what comes out in the wash won't be very pretty? Not in the least. I went to the trouble of looking into the details of your background, Mrs. Blake. I wouldn't exactly call it nice reading for the kiddies. Three husbands... One of them had to go to Mexico for his health when the Justice Department cracked down on the chemical monopoly. Another husband of yours has been barred from every racetrack in the country. Then there was that party in Hollywood where you ducked a marijuana charge that might have meant five years in the clink. How did you get out of that one? I off the judge. Where'd you get all that information? I called up the answer man. Very funny. Shall I tell you why you really came here, Mrs. Blake? I want to know who killed my husband. You came here because the life insurance company is ready to ante up with a small fortune now. You're his beneficiary. You're afraid I could prevent that by coming up with evidence that uh, you might have done the killing yourself. You want to make sure I'll stay out of the picture. You are going to stay out of the picture, Mr. Abbott. Well, I'll tell you the next step, too. Now comes the pearl-handled revolver in the pocketbook. When you get shot with one of those, you're just as dead as with the other kind. So help me if you stop from if you stop me from collecting Dexter's life insurance. Threats I... are a dime a dozen to me, Mrs. Blake. They're part of my business. I collect them, like other people collect butterflies. Good afternoon, Mrs. Blake. Look, you two-bit key old peeper. If you and your junior G-man badge stand between me and a couple of million bucks, it wouldn't mean a thing to me to kill you. I've done a little investigating myself. Details about your background. 
You're mixed up in half a dozen cases where one of the suspects might knock you off at any time. And if you're ever found dead, my friend, it'd take the police forever to figure who did it. They'd get into a jigsaw puzzle that'd have them flipping. And I don't mind telling you about it this way either, because I also found out your office isn't tapped. That's very thoughtful of you. I think of everything. Like, for instance, down at the piers, there are men who would be only too glad to take care of you for me. I can buy your death, Pat Abbott. A man no one ever heard of, no connection with you, bumps you off. Disappears on a boat to heaven only knows where. I wonder if you're so upset with me because I might cost you the two million bucks or because I froze up when you made a play for me. Oh, it's the two million. And as for you, personally, I... I said good afternoon, Mrs. Blake, a long time ago. You're underestimating me, Mr. Abbott. And you may not live to regret it. Good afternoon, Mrs. Blake. That little interruption over, Pat went on to the insurance company's office to see Frank Tracy. Now, Mr. Tracy, I think I've got your man. Really? Mm -hmm. Who is he? He lives at 1785 Bayside. Smooth-looking chap, tall, thin, dresses very well. Oh. How did you do it? Uh, did you see the necklace? How can you be sure? I arranged a trap for him. Got him to go after a necklace my wife purposely wore to the Stardust Club. I see. Well, uh, what are we waiting for? Why don't no, we... No, 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 no. If we sail in and grab him now, we won't have much evidence to hold him on. We've got to give him more rope. He's seeing my wife again tonight. Is he uh, connected with Kathy Blake, as I suspected? Well, that's hard to tell. But give me another 24 hours. I think we'll strike oil. You mean we can arrest him within 24 hours? Probably. Excellent, Mr. Abbott, excellent. Now, uh, do be careful. Francis is liable to be very slippery. Oh, uh, how about Mrs. Blake? Do we just let her wander around? Yeah. Remember the nursery rhyme about the lost sheep? Leave them alone, and they'll come home. That night, I put on a very slinky evening gown. I was getting ready for another session at the club. But Pat stopped me. Ah, uh, you're not going to the club, Jean. Oh, Pat Abbott, just because you're going to close in on Francis, you're getting the willies. You're afraid I'll be hurt. No, that's not the reason. Well, then what is it? Francis won't be at the club to see you. He's going to be late. Very late. I couldn't follow Pat's reasoning at the moment. But, as I learned later, Francis was at home just then having a visitor. One second. Sorry to keep you waiting, I... What are you doing here? Why the... Why the gun? I... I didn't make any mistakes. Put down the gun. Put down the gun. You did make a mistake, Al. No, Tracy, no. I... I did everything you said. But I told you not to kill anyone, Al. Blake tried to stop me. He started screaming for the police. Then you should have beat it. Well, you told me... Where I... is the necklace? It's in the dresser drawer. Now, here, I... I'll get it for you. Here. Here's the necklace. Thank you, Al. Lovely, isn't it? I didn't mean to kill Blake. I just wanted to shut him up. I just went to hit him in the leg. You were very careless. They're not too close to me, are they? Now, take your hide. Where is he? Who is he? Abbott. He's very close, Al. Too close for comfort. Well, well what do we do? Oh, the answer is simple. Well, can you get me out of here? Uh, get me out of the country, maybe? Till things cool off? No, Al. Well, then, give me my cut on the necklace. I know some people. They'll help. With 25 grand, I can travel fast. You're not getting any money. Well, then what... It's terribly dangerous for me to have you alive, Al. You get rattled too easily. You might say something that would be very embarrassing well, to now, me. Now, wait, wait, Tracy. Uh, listen, uh, listen to me. I don't want to cut. I... I wouldn't sing to Abbott. 
I'll go away. That's all I want. I, I want. I want to get away. You. You've got to let me. Uh, sorry, Al. It would be stupid of me to let you go. Wherever you are, you're a potential threat to me. Now we're wasting time. No, don't shoot, so... Tracy. Don't shoot. Don't shoot. Drop the gun, Tracy. What? Abbott. Ow. Ow. My hand. Keep away from that window, Al. Oh. I've got more bullets and I like playing rough, remember? Oh, you're the, the cab driver. That's right. I overheard your conversation, Tracy. Al wasn't half as careless as you were. Look, maybe we we can make a deal, Abbott. What do you say, uh... How about a deal? Your company had a very high recovery rate on jewelry, Tracy. And you insisted on not working with the police. That seemed kind of strange. But you clinched it yourself the last time we talked. When I told you I'd found our man, you said Francis is liable to be very slippery. I'd never mentioned his name, Tracy. Look, I... I I've got plenty of money, Abbott. To make it worth your while to forget this. I purposely told you I wasn't closing in on Al for 24 hours. I knew you'd come in here to see him. Now, get up, Tracy. How's 10,000 cash right now? Stand up. 15,000? I said stand up. You too, Al. I've got the same taxi waiting, Francis. The one we were in before. But this time, we'll all have a nice, quiet, smooth ride. This time, we'll have a police escort. A few hours later, Pat had disposed of his two friends and had come home to his ever-loving wife. Well, darling, I suppose you're full of questions, as usual. As usual. Tracy had a very cushy spot figured out for himself, didn't he, Pat? He sure did. The lug steals the jewelry. Tracy gets his company to shell out, uh, oh, say, $50,000 to get it back. And Tracy quietly splits it with his pal. The company saves a fortune. Gal gets her necklace. Everything is moonlight and roses. Mm. Well, what about Mrs. Blake? <laughs> no, she was just a hellcat. She wasn't in on this deal at all. Okay, Bob. Now, how do we go about celebrating your solving the case? You want to go down to Fisherman's Wharf and have a seafood banquet? Oh, I don't know. Head for Chinatown and have... Press duck? Maybe. Um, I'm not sure. Hmm. Well, you got any other suggestions? Well, yes, I did have something else in mind. Uh, what do we got in the refrigerator? Just some cold chicken, a couple of cans of beer. Well, let's stay right here and eat alone. Hmm? But why? Because right here they got services the other places don't have on the menu. National Broadcasting Company has presented The Adventures of the Abbots, starring Claudia Morgan and Les Damon as those popular personalities of detective fiction, Pat and Jean Abbott, created by Francis Crane. In our story tonight, Miss Sherry Britton portrayed the role of Kathy Dexter. Others in the cast were Everett Sloan and Santos Ortega. The Adventures of the Abbots was written by Howard Merrill. Original music composed and conducted by Dewey Bergman. Produced by Ted Lloyd and Bernard L. Schubert. Directed and recorded by Harry Frazee. And now this is Wayne Howell inviting you to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting adventure in crime with Pat and Jean in The Adventures of the Abbots. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.